Hello, my name is Maureen Janowski and I am pleased to present to you protein supplements for patients in long-term care, when and why it is appropriate. I am very fortunate enough to have worked with older adults in long-term care for about 20 years. There is plenty of research that shows us that elderly patients in long-term care settings are at higher risk for not only protein energy malnutrition, but also pressure injuries, falls, sarcopenia, and healthcare acquired infections. This risk comes from a combination of factors, including diseases, decreased physical ability, which impacts the older adult's muscles and functional status, weight loss, and mental status, which may include dementia, confusion, depression, or loneliness. These risk factors combined with limited income often impact the patient's nutritional status and ability to consume adequate intake. Limited intake or inadequate nutrient intake is a significant issue amongst older adults. This could be due to disease, food preference, such as avoiding certain foods due to intolerances, difficulty chewing, things like that, or access to nutritious food. Weight loss is a very important sign that intervention is needed. Did you know that the rate of malnutrition is highest in older adults? Looking at this chart here, we can see that we jump from 437 of 100,000 patients aged 40 to 64 to 1,487 for patients aged 65 to 84. And then that number more than doubles to 3,754 for our patients over 85 years. These numbers tell us a very important story. Malnutrition, as we all know, is associated with many severe health complications, including increased mortality, immune suppression, muscle wasting, longer length of hospital stay, and higher healthcare costs in older adults. Of all the patients over 65 years of age in the U.S. hospital in 2016, almost 30% of those that were discharged were discharged to a nursing home or a rehab facility. So let's review some of the clinical facts. With aging comes an increased need for dietary protein. This can help slow down the natural progression of losing lean body mass, which is necessary to maintain functionality and decrease the risk of frailty and sarcopenia. Protein is needed to promote recovery from illness and support good health. Older adults need to make up for age-related changes to protein metabolism and offset inflammatory and catabolic conditions associated with chronic and acute illnesses commonly associated with aging. Inactivity due to hospitalization or limited activity in the long-term care setting can have a very negative effect on the older adult. Research has shown us that inactive older adults, 85 and plus, lose about 1,000 grams of lean leg mass in four days. Now compare that to an inactive middle-aged patient, this loss takes 14 days. So four days is a very short time period. Nursing home residents are at high risk for malnutrition because up to 18% have a BMI less than 20, almost 8% have significant weight loss, and about 8% have severe decreased intake. Low BMI, significant weight loss and decreased intake are all risk indicators for malnutrition and poor nutritional outcomes. The quicker we begin intervention, the better the patient outcomes. In addition to the low BMI, weight loss and decreased intake, many of our older adults aren't even consuming enough protein to meet the RDA, the recommended daily allowance. This could be due to chewing difficulties, chewing meats is often difficult, or the inability to afford higher priced foods, which include many of the animal protein sources, mental and functional status, such as forgetting to eat, lack of energy to prepare and eat meals, depression, etc., or many other reasons. The RDA for protein is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. But the RDA is set 
as the minimum level that meets nutrient requirements of 97 to 98% of healthy individuals. When we're talking about malnutrition and the associated complications, obviously we aren't talking about healthy individuals. The general consensus is that older adults need 1.0 to 1.2 grams of kilograms per day. And those with acute or chronic disease need even more 1.2 to 1.5 grams per day, except for those with severe kidney disease not on dialysis. It's important to note that better functional outcomes are achieved when the protein is increased along with exercise. So here's the results of a systematic review. 13 studies were included in the systematic review. Studies were heterogeneous and in interventions, four looked at nutrition interventions, six looked at physical exercise plus nutrition intervention, one looked at timing of protein provision, one on exercise plus dietary advice, and one on nutrition related nursing care. Among the nine interventions that tested oral nutrition supplements, ONS, with protein, with or without exercise, seven studies reported on protein intake. Six showed increased protein intakes. Two of five studies showed increased albumin levels. And five of nine reported an improvement in functional outcomes. This data shows us that Older adults do better with treatment outcomes when they meet their protein needs and protein supplements are a part of their medical nutritional therapy plan. So, as clinical professionals, what should our course of action be? First, let's ensure that all patients are screened for nutrition risk. If identified at risk, the RDN should complete a nutrition assessment to determine the appropriate nutrition plan of care. During the assessment process, ask appropriate questions about the patient's intake. Ask about types of foods as well as amounts of foods consumed. As we just discussed, many older adults don't meet their protein and energy requirements. If the patient is on a therapeutic diet, ask yourself if it's really necessary. Liberalize diet restrictions whenever possible. Realistically, if a patient is only eating 50% of their meal, do we really need to be concerned with their fat or sodium intake? There's a lot of research that shows us that older adults with unintended weight loss are at higher risk for mortality. Avoiding diet restrictions has shown to increase intake. A key point here is that malnutrition screening is needed for all patients and often with the RDN assessment for all at risk of malnutrition. It is very common that older adults are not meeting their protein needs, and it's important to address this nutrition gap. When the results of the assessment shows decreased protein and calorie intake, we need to find a way to increase protein and calorie. Fortifying foods or providing additional servings of well-liked, high-protein, high-calorie foods is one avenue. Sometimes this works really well. However, it's not uncommon for the older adult patient to have a small appetite, so adding even more food to their meals is often not consumed. The extra protein and calories only help if they are consumed. In these cases, we often find that initiating oral nutrition supplement works well. These are easy to consume, which is more acceptable for the weakened patients. Studies have shown that the use of ONS, oral nutritional supplements, can improve dietary intake and body weight and lower the risk of complications during the hospital stay. If the patient is consuming enough calories, but inadequate protein, then using a concentrated liquid protein may be beneficial. These can be added to foods that the patient is already consuming so as not to add in extra food. A concentrated liquid protein can also be used to add in extra protein to meals when a patient refuses ONS. Concentrated liquid protein is very low volume, one fluid ounce serving, and can be a nutrient dense protein option when needed to meet the estimated protein needs. Work with physical therapy and occupational therapy to start an exercise program. 
As mentioned earlier, there is a strong synergistic effect of protein and exercise. For example, in a 2011 study by Simons, they showed that eating a protein meal of about 30 grams per protein alone increased protein synthesis by 50% over fasting. But eating a protein meal in addition to exercise increased protein synthesis another 50%, so 100% increase over fasting. Research has shown that to have the best positive effect on protein synthesis, 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal is ideal. Less than 15 grams of protein per meal doesn't provide much muscle protein synthesis, but anything over 30 grams is wasted. So ideally, 30 grams of protein at breakfast, lunch, and dinner allows for muscle anabolism. Adding a protein supplement to the nutrition plan of care can be a helpful tool to achieve this goal of 30 grams of protein per meal. Continuing the nutrition care plan throughout the continuum of care is especially important for our older adults. Malnutrition is not likely to be cured during a hospital stay. The clinical team needs to continue to support the patient's nutritional status with ongoing follow-up from a dietitian. This synergy can reduce hospital readmissions for older adults and aim to reduce the incidence of malnutrition in older adults overall. So let's do a quick case study. So here we have a 70-year-old male with COPD and CHF, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and congestive heart failure. Weight is 165 pounds. So protein requirement is at 1.2 grams per kilogram or 90 grams of protein. He has a small appetite and he is supposed to watch his fluid consumption. So to consume 90 grams of protein, his meal plan may look like this. Wow, that is a lot of food for someone with a small appetite to consume. Even if he could eat all that, this is still about 12 grams of protein shy. So here's his patient situation and this is how we can help. So the RDN does the assessment. We know they need 1.2 grams of protein. Uh, the resident may struggle to meet the recommended 90 grams. So thinking about that and knowing that they're going to have a hard time eating everything that's on there, we would consider a concentrated liquid protein. So we would have the provider order the concentrated liquid protein to be given with MedPass or with meals. We would also consider having physical therapy implement an exercise program, and then have the nutrition and nursing staff monitor the weight, the calorie and protein intake, fluid volume, and appetite. The red flag indicates a trigger when to pay extra attention to these patients or flag for an RDN assessment. So what are the key steps and overall decision making that go into providing adequate protein for the patients in long-term care? Here is a clinical decision tree for protein supplementation in long-term care patients. The red flags here help us know what conditions and considerations to watch for that put our patients at risk for protein energy malnutrition. I found this chart to be especially helpful to ensure we don't miss out on identifying patients at risk. It's nice to have this one resource to help outline the key risk areas to look for. This is especially useful in training new RDNs or RDNs new to long-term care. The second part of the clinical decision tree for protein supplementation in long-term care patients outlines the steps in providing the additional protein the long-term care resident might require. If we follow along here, we can see that if the resident is meeting their protein needs, then we continue our plan of care and reevaluate according to the policy. But if they aren't, this chart helps us know if ONS or a concentrated liquid protein is a better option. It also helps us to walk through what to do when oral nutrition supplements or fortified foods are given but not fully consumed. What do we try then? The reason that I like this chart so much is because it doesn't stop just with offering the supplement. We don't want to offer an ONS and then not circle back to ensure that our interventions are tolerated and being consumed. 
It's always important to evaluate each intervention to ensure it is effective. Sometimes we might start a resident on oral nutrition supplements only to find that they aren't drinking it. Then we want to move on to adding concentrated liquid protein to the foods that we know this resident is eating. This flowchart helps ensure that we evaluate all the possibilities to ensure we are planning their nutrition care to lead to the best possible outcomes. Thank you very much for viewing this short video. Listed here are all the references we use for this presentation. Have a great day.